Converted on LSD Trip by David Clark. Chapter 14 Conversion from Crime to Christ. Having worked through and experienced many things, I often thought about life and its meaning. I could recall the absolute emptiness of my soul after going out for the evening and coming home late at night. All was empty, and what was the point to it all? I was seeking an answer to life the universe, and everything. The following is an account taken from memory and notes made of my experience of conversion to Jesus Christ on Friday the 16th of January 1970. Towards the end of 1969, I was continuing my studies at Luton College, learning radio and television servicing. We would often in class engage in discussions and it was quite easy for us to distract the lecturer to talk about subjects like spiritualism and the like. We would discuss what would happen if there was another world war. We would talk about the future, as portrayed by Nostradamus, drugs and other experiences. At that time I was informed of a new film called Easy Rider and wanted to see it. On one occasion at college I obtained some hashish and smoked, with opium as well, and smoked it during our break. This was so effectual, I made use of the sick room in college to sleep the effect and enjoy the illusionary effects of the drugs which amused all my student friends. On another occasion, in January 1970, I had obtained four tablets of LSD from Peter Coppernall, a student friend of mine from Bedford. He was one of my fellow students at Luton College, and I decided to take them the following Friday night, the 16th of January, 1970. On that Friday night, Michael and I decided to take half a tablet of acid each. Pat Jones had a quarter. He had been my close friend, and he was only 16 years old, and I treated him like my apprentice. I taught him all my bad ways. There was little we didn't do together. I had known him whilst he was still at school, and encouraged him in crime, sniffing chloroform, smoking marijuana, hashish, weed, drunkenness, violence and permissive sex. He was known amongst the friends in Aylesby as Bones, Patrick Bones. My brother was going out that night with his girlfriend Karen Mead, so Pat Jones and I decided to walk uptown and not risk driving. We did not know how the drugs would affect us. I was dressed in my old clothes deliberately, but I did not know what might happen. We tried to thumb a lift, but eventually caught the bus and got off at the bottom of the high street in Aylesbury. As we walked past the pictures, I noticed the film Easy Rider that was being shown, so we decided we would go and see it. We wanted to take someone else with us, someone in the right state of mind, as we didn't know what would happen to us. So we went to the billiard hall and found Bernie Gilbert and Mike Ellis, but they said they would only come with us to watch the film if they had some acid too. So I decided this was okay and we went back to my home in the taxi and got the rest of the acid. Bernie had half a tablet, Mick Ellis had the other quarter, so all four of us were about to trip on acid while watching the film Easy Rider. We arrived back at the pictures at 8.45 and I fumbled a bit with my ticket as the acid had begun to take its effect. Well, Mick and Bernie suggested we go and sit in the balcony, but I thought to myself, what if we decide to jump off? I was tripping now and just followed them up the stairs. So we sat two in front of each other and two behind. But Mick and Bernie's trip had not yet begun. They still acted and spoke normally. I did not realise how tripped I was until the film was finished. In fact, the film records Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper actually experiencing an LSD trip during the film. During the film, the acid had taken me on a very pleasant trip in time with the music. It was almost as though the film crew had deliberately filmed the film for me. They seemed to know just how to give the correct lighting and sound effects. However, Bernie and Mick seemed to be jumping about all over the place and it was irritating me. I was still sitting in my seat when all the people had gone before I decided there was nothing more to do. So we decided to up and go, but Mick and Bernie were annoying me because they were just mucking about. All my thoughts and feelings began to reverberate four times over, and thought patterns were being reflected and at the same time building and snowballing. 
we walked outside of the cinema and I said to the boys, man, you're not, you're all on a wrong scene. You can't be turned on. Then I heard Mick and Bernie say, he's turned into a wizard. That's a hippie. And there was a club room just for like people like me, wizards that is, the Dark Lantern, that was in the pub in Aylesbury. I then began a downward trip, which ended in the horrors. I began to feel paranoid, thinking that they were sorry for me and were being polite and hiding their feelings from me. As we went further up the street, Mick Ellis asked if I wanted to scrap with some blokes across the street. It was as if he was testing me out to see if I was still the same person he knew. I said, no, I didn't. I thought, I thought that they thought I'd gone mad and they wanted to test me out. We went further up the high street and Bernie began to mess about and pull faces at me and make noises. I hid in the shop doorway and told him to stop it and Pat Jones pulled Bernie away saying, don't do it, he didn't understand. My horror began when I could not face the fact that they thought I'd cracked up and gone mad. This feeling was too much for me to bear. More, however, was to come. We decided to go to the Crown Pub and Brian Sale came up to me and spoke something to me but I was out of my mind uh, and I was feeling paranoid and I couldn't speak anything to him sensibly so I had to tell him quickly that I, I, I was drunk. I knew he wouldn't understand otherwise. I then saw Michael, my brother, sitting with his girlfriend and went up to them and told them what was happening. He laughed and motioned to wind me up like a clockwork toy and then my mind began to distort so much so that I began to run out, I ran out the pub to get away. Pat Jones followed me and I kept thinking about the others. Were they following us? I kept looking back as I didn't want them to follow us as they were annoying me. We left the Crown Pub and walked towards Mount Street via Rickford's Hill along Friaridge Way. On the way down it seemed like a scene from the picture book in Alice in Wonderland as all the street lights were sparkling and brilliantly bright. The torment of my mind had begun to get more. The torment of my mind had grown so much that I could not bear the pain but I could not get rid of the torment. Ken and Grace Knight lived at Mount Street. We went down there with no real aim. As I arrived, just out of the house was Jock McCallion, another friend of mine. He was about to leave in his car and drive off. I jumped in beside him and told him my situation. After telling him I was tripped out of my mind, I was thinking that he would take me home. And as I was about to uh, ask him, he said, Dave, you're a worried man. I knew this, and now I thought, so did he and everyone else, and this didn't help me at all. My mind was about to blow, so I just jumped out of the car again and ran. Straight into 24 Mount Street, where Ken and Grace were, I wanted to escape, so I told them my plight, but I could not explain to them what was happening to me. Mrs Knight recalled, she thought, I was in serious trouble, and began to question me. This didn't help. So I had to say forcefully, I must have peace. So they took me out to their summer house to lay down in their back garden for some peace. No one seemed to understand the torment of mind that I was in. And no one could help me at all. I told Mrs Knight to leave me alone, to work it out on my own and let me lie down. Then the torment got worse. I knew it was only the LSD doing it, but I could do nothing about it. I would have to wait till it had taken its course. I thought it could be 12 hours or so, but to me, each moment seemed like an eternity of torment, and I could not endure this any more. I lay down and tried to settle my mind by thinking good thoughts, different thoughts, but my mind would not be controlled. The thought came, I might be driven to kill myself, to get rid of the pain. I was horrified at this thought, and the more I tried to stop thinking like it, the more I thought about it. I looked around to see if there was any glass or, or a mirror in the room. Uh, I wanted to get rid of it just in case I cut my throat or wrists. I just did not know what to do. I was at the end of myself. In this condition, it was evident. I could not help myself. My friends couldn't help me. My brother hadn't helped me. Mr. Mrs. Knight couldn't help me and I couldn't help myself. In this desperation, it came to me to call out to God for help. So I cried out, crying on the Lord's name, Jesus, please help me. At that moment, my mind went blank. His name appeared in the imagination of my mind, but the torment soon came back. 
I cried out again, and his name appeared twice, and happened. this happened repeatedly. I called four times in all, and his name appeared four times and formed a square in complete emptiness. I then began to feel emotional and wept, but I didn't know why. And at that moment, Mrs Knight came to the chalet door to see if she could help. It was then that a flood of guilt came upon me. I was convicted of a sin of adultery and did not know what to do. I beckoned to Mrs Knight to come in and said to her, did she realise how bad I was and uh, what could I do? I asked her, tell me the way, for I knew and believe she knew. Mrs Knight had spoken to me about Christian things some time ago and I knew that she knew the way. Mrs Knight sat down and quoted scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's John 3.16. After this, Jesus spoke to me. I heard his voice as clearly as I'm reading this text now. Dave, I'm with you. You've been searching for a long time. This is what our Father says. What you've been going through is nothing compared to what hell is like. I replied with thanksgiving, saying, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mrs Knight thought that I was speaking to her, and she did not know what was going on. It seemed that the words that Mrs Knight had spoken were, in fact, the way and a pathway to my escape. It appeared as though I was at the bottom of a pyramid, and the words were the way to the top. And if I were to follow the words, I would escape. I replied, thank you, Jesus, thank you. I then thought of hell and my thoughts were with Pat Jones, Bernie Gilbert, Mick Ellis, and I said, what about the others? Jesus spoke again to me and said, all I could do was tell them. I replied, feeling it's impossible, an impossible thing to do to convince them. What more could I do? I was feeling the agony of the LSD and I knew I wanted to warn my friends of the hell to come. I reasoned within myself they would think I've gone mad on LSD. How could I convince them? I wanted to do more than just tell them. I asked, what more could I do? In order to answer my question, he took me back in time, showing me all I could do was tell them. And this is how he did it. A number of weeks ago, I had read in the Old Testament about the curses that were to come upon the children of Israel if they forsook the law and the covenant in Deuteronomy 28 verse 53. And the verse said this, Thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body. Now I knew nothing about the background of what this meant at all. And I simply thought it was saying that a woman would be so hungry uh, in a time of famine, she'd, be, she'd, eat, she'd even eat, in a time of famine, she'd eat her own afterbirth. Which of course was shocking. Now, with this in mind, uh, these weeks earlier, I was trying to shock a girl at work, because that's what I used to do, silly things like that. I was working for Radio Rentals as a colour TV engineer, and I, had to, and I talked to this receptionist and said to her, how would she like to be so hungry to have to eat her own afterbirth? She responded with expected repulsion. Oh, how could you say such a thing? I simply said, I hadn't said it. But God has. The thing repulsed her, and she did not want to know anything about what I was saying. Not surprising. However, to this incident, Jesus took me and asked me, what did the girl do when I spoke to her? My answer was, she shut her eyes. She did not want to know. It was repulsive to her. Now, his reply to me was that if you tell people about hell and uh, what you've learned, and they screw up their faces and they don't want to know, then you can do no more. The condition of the person listening is not my responsibility, but theirs. All I could do was tell them. So tell them I would. To these questions, Mrs Knight thought I was asking her because I was speaking aloud. But before she could answer me, I had been given answers directly from the Lord. Then Jesus stopped speaking. I felt as though I was falling back into my torment and I prayed again, please don't leave me, don't leave me. His reply was, I will never leave you. 
Jesus then questioned me and asked me, he said, why boast? This is because I was naturally prone to boasting amongst my friends, just to make a good impression. I reason within myself now and now knew I had no need to boast of anything. So from that day, I've always avoided boasting. My torment ceased from that time and the rest of the night passed with various thoughts going through my mind. Mrs Knight was not aware or fully aware of what had taken place. The next day was Saturday and I was due to work, but I decided to take the day off. I phoned in work, saying briefly, Dara's not coming in. That's the end of chapter 14. Now we go on to chapter 15. (laughs) 